Hello and welcome to episode 79 of Communicast, the podcast dedicated to enhancing communication skills. I'm your host, Scott D'Amico, president of Communispond. Today I'm joined by Candy Motzek, a former engineer and senior leader turned business coach for coaches. Candy takes us on her transformative journey from engineering and corporate real estate to empowering others through coaching, highlighting the critical role of communication, connection, and deep listening. Tune in as we explore how intentional communication can drive both professional success and personal fulfillment. Let's dive in. Candy, thank you so much for joining me today. Hi, Scott. Thanks so much for having me. My pleasure. Before we jump too far into it, why don't you take a moment just to tell the the listeners a little bit about you, your journey, and the exciting work that you're doing today? Yeah, for sure. Um, So the journey, it's long because I'm old. We'll start with that. (laughs) But I started as an engineer. And so I've got a real systems brain. And then through my career, I climbed up through that corporate ladder. I was big in corporate for years and years climbed the ladder, moved up through the junior positions and into a senior leadership role for quite a few years, mainly in corporate real estate, um, in the finance area specifically. And it was great until it wasn't. And, you know, life happens. I changed, I evolved and the world of corporate changed as well. And it was time for something different. Um, I was on an unusual cruise, and it was a cruise from Santiago, Chile, to Antarctica, back through the Falkland Islands, and to Buenos Aires. And in that three-week cruise, it was just time for a change. And so, basically, I put in my exit plan, and I decided to become a coach. I'm a business coach for coaches right now, and I coach some senior leaders as well, still in corporate. Um, But just that transition, you know, going from senior leader to coach, it's a very different kind of career. And honestly, it has been just the best thing ever. Oh, I love hearing that. And first, that cruise sounds amazing. Uh, Fantastic. Just the the locations, the path and a three week cruise obviously seems like you had some really good time to reflect there and come up with a plan forward. But yeah, as I think about that engineer, kind of having that systems brain, being in corporate real estate and the finance aspect of it, and then going into coaching coaches, it's a pretty big leap. But I would think that if you were a a solid, a great leader, you were already coaching people. You you had that in your tool belt, right? So you probably mm-hmm. saw that connection. But yeah, can you kind of tell me what what was inside you or what brought that about that, I guess the the urge to kind of go into coaching and step away from real estate or your career and really specifically into coaching? Yeah, I think it is that I was deeply connected with my team and their development was so important to me. And as as you said, I was already coaching in a capacity for sure. I wasn't a trained coach. And so, you know, there's some different skill sets that come with being a coach, but I was already doing a lot of that. And so much of my role had its title and its responsibilities and deliverables, but I spent the large chunk of every day with people walking into my office, closing the door and saying, do you have a minute? I've got something going on and I need to talk it through. So I loved that part of it. And I was really invested in my team and supporting them in their growth. So it became an, even though, overtly it didn't look like a natural transition it really was because i was already doing that people work absolutely yeah as you mentioned when you're when you're really invested in your team and one of your priorities is to help them grow and develop it's just exciting to be able to take that and do it full time as a career and it seems like if people were coming to you closing the door people on your team and likely probably some people not even on your team because they knew you were that person to go to uh Right. It seems like that that skill set was already there, trained or not. Uh, there's a big part of it that you already have inside you that you can leverage into that new career journey. So that's really cool to hear. So if, if I think about the experience that you've had, as you mentioned, in the corporate space, having a successful career, moving into senior, senior leadership positions, and then also now coaching coaches, probably interact with a wide variety of people, lots of different skill sets when it comes to communications. 
probably encountered some great ones, some not so great ones. But when you hear this, this idea or this term that somebody is a great communicator or they have very strong communication skills, what's the image that comes to mind for you? Mm, yeah, I love that question, Scott. So for me, when I think about communication, I'm thinking of connection. That's the, that's the word that sort of matches there for me. And the piece that I see so strongly is that it's time for us all to listen more deeply. You know, so that is the skill that I think that everybody can learn and improve. And when we take responsibility for the listening side of the conversation, whether it be a verbal conversation or we're part of some kind of an interaction, when we get good at listening, it helps all of the communication because then people feel heard, right? They're seen, they're heard, they're mad, they matter. And that connection creates the emotional safety that you want for people to do great work. Yeah, I love that you brought up this idea of communication is about connections. Oftentimes when people think of a great communicator, they, they simply think of somebody that feels comfortable communicating. And there's a big difference between being comfortable communicating and being really good and effective at it and creating those connections. Because if you're not creating connections, it's you're just putting words out into the ether. They're not landing and they're not ultimately, I think, achieving your goal, whether whatever that is to move people to action, to get them to think, feel, behave, act differently. It really is about how can you connect with someone? And as you mentioned, the best way to do that is to listen because it's going to help inform not only what you say, how you say it, when you say it, what channel you use to deliver the message. So spot on, couldn't agree more that really to improve those communication skills and make connections, double down on the listening, really create an environment where you can listen and I think honestly, just be interested, be interested in listening. Exactly. And you, especially, and I would think you know, someone with the systems brain and I, while I'm not an engineer, I kind of have the, that meth kind of a, uh, I don't know what the right word is here, the methodical way of approaching things, very systems oriented and very solutions oriented. So for me, this is a skill I've had to work on a lot to really listen and not immediately jump in and want to try and fix things, right? Being a natural fixer, when someone brings some something to you, the knee jerk reaction is to, okay, here's how you do it. And I get this a lot with my kids. Sometimes it is, it's pausing, understanding, okay, are they looking for a solution? Are they looking just to kind of get something out and process it on their own and talk through it? By being patient and listening, you can kind of help pick up on those cues. Mm, I really like that. And also that, you know, the ability to ask them a question, you know, like, what have you tried so far? You know, just showing that respect that, you know, that they've already, they're already partly through the process. And unless you ask and listen, you don't really know what they need. I just want to, I hope it's okay if I just rewind to this place where you said that sometimes communication feels comfortable and sometimes it doesn't feel as comfortable. And I think that that's really interesting because people who are natural speakers, you know, that process verbally, especially, they might feel very comfortable and think that they're a comfortable communicator. Mm -hmm. And I just want to be clear that even though I practice listening, like, quite consciously and intentionally, I'm not always comfortable because I have to hold myself back and say, hold your mouth, don't say anything, <laughs> you know, like, listen, don't talk, right? And so it, 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 sometimes that place of comfort is not what we're looking for. And so I really mm -hmm. like the way you brought that up. Like, it's okay to be uncomfortable in that position. It's not Comfort isn't a sign that you're doing a great job. Sometimes it's more in the, the after effect and the connection and what happens after you have that conversation. And tip, typically when you are feeling that discomfort, that's where the growth comes from, whether it is through some sort of physical activity as you're working those muscles, breaking them down, they're building back up just like with a skill. And you know, we hear this a lot in a lot of the trainings that we do, because we focus a lot on public speaking and presentation skills and sales dialogue, things like that. 
So when we're teaching people new skills that are maybe different than what they're used to or counter to what they're used to and the way that we coach, it, it does put them in this sense of discomfort, but that's where we see the transition happen. So sometimes it is good to be uncomfortable. As you mentioned, I'm just like, I sometimes I just like, ah, I want to say something so bad, but I know that, no, this is not the time. Ask a few more questions, get a little bit more clarity, get a sense of where they're coming from, what they're feeling. As you mentioned, what have they tried already? Because if I start jumping in with a solution and they're like, yeah, yeah, I already did that. It's a waste of both of our times. So that's why it's so important to pause, process, ask questions before you start to formulate those responses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So as, as you're out there and you're, you're working with your clients, I think you mentioned you're, you're coaching coaches so people that have a business of coaching others, you're working to help them grow and grow their business. What are some of the skills either that from a soft skills perspective, either you're seeing some of your coaches perhaps are needing you're working to develop or on the flip side, as they're going out and working with people, depending on their type of practice, I guess in general, like in the job place, in the marketplace today, what are some of the key soft skills that really are in need of development that are critical to the business? Yeah. So we've already talked about listening and listening is within the conversations, but also at meetings and presentations, watching the dynamics. So we've already covered that. Other skills that I think are really vital are curiosity. You know, like, can we be really curious, not know the answer and be really open to learning a new way to maybe asking that unusual question. So curiosity is a great skill and presence, being fully present, undistracted. When you notice your brain sort of skittering off and thinking thoughts just to sort of bring your focus back to the place that you are to really stay present with the people or person that you're with, that is a super great skill and to hold space. So holding space is kind of a coaching term, but what it means is that I don't have to rush forward to try and fix it. Just like you were saying earlier, I can be here. We can hold this place together. It can be a little uncomfortable and it's okay. You don't always have to be comfortable. So that holding space gives people a place to think gives them a place to process, to maybe try something else. Again, to create a little bit of safety that they could maybe say something they haven't said before in a different way. And who knows what'll happen. So I think those are the, those are the other skills that I like to see people work on. Curiosity is something that, that really interests me. I am a very much naturally curious person person. I'm sure I drive my wife and kids crazy with it. And even just people that I work with, because I, I, I want to know how things work. I want to understand if something's broken, you know, why, what are all the components of it from a technical standpoint, but just all times I'll just ask questions, very granular questions, not to challenge, but just because out of sheer curiosity, I want to know. And a lot of people think, oh, some people are just naturally inquisitive. They're naturally curious, but I think it's a skill that everybody has. It can absolutely be honed and developed. And if we think back to when we were kids and for anyone that's listening that has especially small children on any given day, how many times you were asked, why, why, why? And for me, I made a very conscious effort when, when the kids were little to always answer, not just say, well, because I would try to come up with some answer because I know that's just feeding that natural curiosity and I think, unfortunately, over time, that kind of gets stamped down in people to not necessarily feel comfortable asking why. But when you think about curiosity, there's just so much benefit that comes from it, whether it is focusing in and helping out on those listening skills. Typically, when people are curious, they tend to listen better because they truly want to know. You find out more things that are going to help inform how you move forward, whether it is with a client and how you're going to bring your proposal forward, or if it is in an internal project you need to get approval for, understanding and really digging into so many different aspects and facets of the project, say from the senior leader's perspective, so that when you're going in there and working to influence an outcome and try to influence a decision to get approval for your project, 
the more that you've asked, the more that you know, I think the better position you are. So for me, curiosity is such a great thing that drives effective communication. Yeah, and to just layer one more thing on there with curiosity is to be curious with yourself. Why mm -hmm. do I make that assumption? Why do I show up and get defensive in that environment? What's going on with me? You know, so yes, totally with the, you know, the external curiosity, but to be curious with our own thought processes and our own growth, because then we're fostering our own growth, which is going to help everything else as well, including our satisfaction. Spot on. Yeah. And it, at a prior company, we had a, a program around innovation and the concept of it really was that innovation and creativity can be taught. Curiosity is a big part of that. And it's very specific skills that lead into it. So if you think of people that question stuff, they ask lots of questions, they observe, they network, and they experiment. Typically those four things lead to associational thinking, which tends to lead to breakthrough and creativity and new products, new innovation. And I just go back to kids. If you, if you watch kids interact, they're very curious. They ask lots of questions. They, they'll play with anyone, right? For the most part, they're, they're out there, they're interacting, they're networking, constantly experimenting. Everything for, a, especially a very small child is an experiment because they've never experienced it before. So they're doing all these things. And that's why kids tend to be so darn creative is they're practicing these skills. They're doing them day in and day out. So as you can work on those types of skills, definitely can lead to more curiosity, more creativity, more innovation at in your life and in your organization. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It reminds me of when my kids were little. You know, everybody has this story of Christmas time came and the boxes got opened and the gifts sat on the side. And what did the kids play with? They played with the boxes, right? Because yes. they were working on their curiosity and on their innovation. And, and we could all benefit from that, you know? Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. That was, that was always the, the frustrating part. I just spent all this money and ran, went all over town to get these toys and they want the box. <laughs> Love yeah. it. Candy, as you think about your career journey, right? Moving up in, in the corporate space, now moving over and running your own business, working with coaches. If you had to boil it down to say, if I, if I held you to say, what's the one key communication skill? that has really helped you to get to this level of success? What would that be? Hmm. It's, you know, it comes back to listening. It's, it's, it's a funny thing, but when I learned how to listen better, it allowed me to ask better questions. And, you know, so if you're in an environment where you don't really understand the team dynamic, you don't really understand the process. Maybe you're in a new project or in, in a new environment. You might be worried about feeling stupid, about looking silly, about how you're perceived. But if you can learn to ask the questions and feel safe asking curiously and then really listening to the responses, you're going to learn so much. So it's this curious asking, but then really listening. And then when you hear the response, watch for what else is going on. You know, watch for the rest of the dynamic. Like they may have said, you know, this these parts go together in this way, but are they excited about it? Or are they tense? Is there something else? You know, so the listening is key, but also be, be curious and ask. That was one of the things that, that helped me the most is, you know, sure, I was an engineer, but I was moving into a different environment. I didn't understand how building systems worked or how power grids work. But then if I was like, okay, well, suck it up, ask the question, find mm -hmm. out. And I'm amazed how people love to answer. They love to answer something that's within their skill set and their knowledge. They love to share. And I kind of created that connection because they knew I was interested in what they had to say, but also in them as a human. So, Yeah, that brings up a really good point. A lot of times people always say someone's favorite, most favorite subject to talk about is themselves, right? So when you're in a personal interaction, as you're asking people about what they do, their interests, things like that, they tend to, you know, pep up a little bit and, and get energized to talk about whether it's their family, their hobbies, whatever it may be. 
But as you mentioned, at work, if you're asking somebody about what their specialty is at work, very similar. They are very excited about it. They're passionate about it. And more often than not, they are very you know, open and more than happy to talk about it and, and tell about it because ultimately it's going to help them. The more people at the organization that are informed about what they're doing, it can help their outcomes. And I think about the you know, position that I'm in currently, uh, about five months ago, I was asked to, to pick up some additional responsibilities for our sister company. And so I'm coming into a kind of a completely net new team, new experience, new product, new processes. So for me, and if you're in this situation out there where you're new, that is the best time to ask questions because you have somewhat of a safety net of, I'm new, I don't know these things. You know, so I'm asking this because, but what I found is to your point, asking questions, it creates connections with people because they're able to talk about what's important to them. But sometimes asking questions from a new perspective, kind of that outsider coming in and just asking, we've seen things, people are like, oh, gosh, you know what? That's a good point. We hadn't thought about that before. So you bring a unique perspective when you kind of come in new and you don't have the blinders on, maybe that people that have been there for a while have. And I don't mean blinders in a negative way, it's just sometimes you, you get into your job and you're doing things and you're so heads down, you don't really step back and look at it. And it reminds me of, of a video I've seen quite a few times on social, different social media, whether it's LinkedIn or Instagram or Facebook, but it's somebody talking with Elon Musk about their rocket ships. And he asked a question, he's like, oh, so right now that's just on the cold thrusters or whatever. I have no idea what it was. And you can see that simple question, you can see Elon Musk, love him or hate him, you could see him, you could literally see the light go off in his head. He's like, oh my gosh, we should be doing this. And this was an interviewer, I believe, asking him a question and it completely changed the way that they build their rocket ships. So sometimes asking a simple question can have a profound impact. Wow, that's great. I love it. Candy, who has been someone from throughout your career that's influenced your communication style? Maybe, you know, a mentor, a former leader, family member, whatever it is, an author, but maybe something that you've taken from them, tweaked a little bit and kind of put it into your toolkit. Yeah, so it's a fellow who used to run a company that I worked for years and years ago. And, you know, back to the old Tom Peters in Search of Excellence book from the early 80s. He, his name was Andy, and he did this so incredibly. Every morning, he would walk through the office, he would do the floor walk, and he would talk with every single person. And he would do that for about 90 minutes a day. And he never had a gotcha. He was never after a fault finding. He was never after a place to assign some more work. He really wanted to see how were things going and how were you as an individual? And at first I'm like, why is this guy doing this? Like, why, why, right? I was young and why is he doing this? What a waste of time. And then I got comfortable with him and he always looked you in the eye and he always had a smile. The thing that I really learned is that he really did care about the team. Mm -hmm. Now, I also know that he was watching the temperature. He, if he had talked to you every single day of that week, he could tell when something was wrong, mm -hmm. when you were stressed, or maybe there was something going on that you just needed a little extra support somewhere. And so that was the role model that really stuck out for me. He listened. It was a very low, um, low effort. He was just, he was just being a friendly guy, but he showed mm -hmm. up every day consistently like that. It was a wonderful role model. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Yeah. The, the consistency is key there, right? Doing that once a month, you're not going to pick up on the trends. You're likely going to get a, a surface level response from people, but as you're doing it day in and day out, it, it shows that you care. And as you mentioned, you're going to pick up on changes and trends as to what's going on. And it's come up a number of time in these conversations, this, I forget, someone mentioned before, they call it almost like just idle chit chat, the benefit of just talking with people, not even business related. And for me, early on in my people leadership career, it's something I struggled with. I was, let's get going, let's get to the point. 
but now stepping back, talking about, you know, the kids or the grandkids or what you do on the weekend or the sports teams, you build those relationships, you create a level of comfort so that when I think things are going wrong, people feel comfortable talking about them and coming to you and, and having open, honest, sometimes tough conversations. And a prior guest who is a CEO of a hospital system, he took the concept of, you know, we've all heard of doctors making their rounds, right? Where they go stop in and see all their patients. In essence, he took that concept and really applied it to all the different teams and divisions within his hospital setting. And he is very diligent with his admin team about scheduling this time and preserving this time on his calendar. Because he said before, what he used to do was basically drive-bys, walking through, hey, how you doing? How you doing? Just kind of waving, you know, like a politician or something. But now he makes sure that he has dedicated time that he can spend in each department on a regular basis talking to these people. And he did talk about what a difference it makes in morale and engagement and just picking up on ideas, the things that you hear when you talk to folks every day, you're going to pick up on some gold nuggets every once in a while. Yeah, for sure. And then instead of just relying on an employee engagement survey that happens once a year, that frankly, most people are not 100% truthful on, mm -hmm. you have a much better idea about what's going on with the team. And it is such a loyalty builder. You know, when people know that you care about them, they're going to do things to support you. They're going to be, they're going to pull together when times are tough. If there's a mistake, if something didn't go the way it was planned, people will pull together to solution it. And I think that you can't, you can't buy that. Right. So. Yeah. The, the concept of the, the engagement survey once a year or doing performance reviews once per year reminds me of the idea of if you're going in and out of the stock market, right? If you catch it on a good day, you catch it on a bad day, uh, it, it's going to have a big difference. Just like if that survey goes out and maybe it's been chaos at your organization for the past couple of months, are you going to get a true accurate reflection of the overall feelings and engagement of employees? Or are you capturing just that snapshot? Or maybe it, it's time to come out right after bonuses come out or something like that, right? you're going to probably get some skewed results versus if you really are interacting and getting that real-time feedback on a regular basis. Yeah. And then it's going to make your, your performance management so much easier as well, because you know, the individuals, you can see what's going on. And like you said, you're going to avoid that halo effect, right? You're going to really be able to see that. Candy, as we are wrapping up here, what advice would you have for folks listening to this, just really in general around the importance of developing these skills and the impact that they can have on their career and quite honestly, their, their personal lives? Yeah, so I think that it's this, these things appear simple and they are. And simple is good. Mm -hmm. You know, to build your listening skills intentionally, practice it be curious, be present and aware and present with the people around you. Those are such core skills that no matter where you are in your career, it's going to stand you in good stead. And if you are mid-career and you haven't been working on these, these could be the difference for that next career jump for you, right? You know, so these are great for new people starting out. They're also great for anybody who's mid-career, ready for that next jump. So go back to the basics and simple can be good. We can always get better at listening better, asking better questions, being more curious, supporting the people on our team. Yeah. You would be amazed or likely not amazed, but how many times we hear this from clients is that, you know, Scott, we have this VP. They're technically great at their job. They're, you know, their technical acumen, solid, great results, but whenever we put them in front of senior leadership or put them in front of a client, the wheels fall off and it's, it's holding them back from moving to the next level in the organization. And as you mentioned, these skills are, it's, it's simple stuff, but it takes work. It takes practice and not practicing once a month, once a quarter, when you have a big presentation or big meeting coming up, it's regular, consistent practice, just like with any other skill, whether you're, working to get into shape, you're working in, on improving your golf game. If I take one golf lesson a year, it's not going to have any impact on my game. Probably if I took them weekly, it still wouldn't have much of an impact, but 
it's a whole nother story. But fortunately, these skills are all teachable and learnable. They just take practice and they take the willingness to be open to it and to put in the work to make them better. So spot on. Candy, thank you so much for joining me. Really did enjoy our conversation. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much for having me. Really enjoyed the conversation as well. And if folks want to get in touch with you and connect with you, what would be the best way for them to do that? Uh, the easiest place to get in touch with me is to come and listen to my podcast. It's called She Coaches Coaches, and I am on all the players. Perfect. She Coaches Coaches, and I will be sure to put a link to that in the show notes for any of you that are looking for it. Candy, thank you again. Have a great day. A special thanks again to my guest, Candy Motzik. Candy's insights on intentional communication and deep listening offered us a fresh perspective on the skills that drive both career success and personal growth. From staying curious to building authentic connections, her advice is a reminder that impactful communication is a skill we can all develop. As we close this episode, remember that mastering communication is a continuous journey. Make sure to stay connected with Communicast by subscribing so you can benefit from conversations with future guests. If you found value in today's episode, I'd be grateful for your support. Leaving a rating or review is a fantastic way to let us know the impact this show has had on you. Thanks and have a great day.